Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's international relations have been extensively studied, from its security policies to its approach to foreign aid. But while the country's diplomats are the center of its relations with the world, little research has been done on their actual work and South Korea's diplomatic culture. To hear more about South Korea's diplomatic style, we had the honor of meeting with Professor Jeffrey Robertson. He spoke to us about the importance of understanding countries' diplomatic styles, South Korea's diplomatic culture, as well as its unique characteristics, and the generational change it is currently undergoing. Jeffrey Robertson is a visiting fellow at the Asia-Pacific College of Diplomacy at the Australian National University and an assistant professor at Yonsei University. In the past, Professor Robertson worked for the Australian government in the field of foreign policy and North Asia. His most recent book, Diplomatic Style and Foreign Policy, explores the insight gained through the recognition and comprehension of diplomatic style. Professor Jeffrey Robertson, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Thank you for letting me have an opportunity to talk. What brought you to South Korea and what got you interested in the diplomatic style of its diplomats? So what brought me to South Korea? Well, uh, for a long time I worked in the Australian government focusing on the Korean Peninsula and East Asia. And um, I guess you could say that ended up bringing me to South Korea. I had the opportunity to uh, start at Yonsei University, an academic career after a government career, and um, I thought that's the way to go. You recently dedicated a whole book to the issue of diplomatic style. What exactly do you mean when you speak of diplomatic style? So in really simple terms, uh, diplomatic style is the unique behavioral characteristics that distinguish the diplomacy of one state from that of another state. But it's, it's a lot deeper than that. Uh, diplomatic style is very interesting in that it's attracted very little academic attention. You know, it's been dismissed as irrelevant by academics who focus on the universal character of diplomacy. You know, diplomats are meant to be more similar to one another than they are to nationals of their own state even. It's been misconstrued as foreign policy in academic texts. It's been touched upon in some academic texts, but um, never really gone into in a very deep way. And in other academic texts, it's just totally absent. So there's, there's a very large volume on diplomatic studies nowadays um, put out by Oxford University Press. And in that text, you know, it's, it's big. It's, it's a big text, bigger than my fist. And in that text, there's not one mention of diplomatic style. But at the same time, practitioners, the diplomats themselves, have a faith-like confidence in diplomatic style. It's really important. It gives them the ability to understand a country's foreign policy. And for me, this was really interesting. And I thought that if somehow I could bring that understanding, that analytical insight to the academic side, it could improve analysis of foreign policy throughout academia. That was my aim. In the book, you are careful to contrast the concept of diplomatic style from other terms, chief of which are diplomacy and foreign policy. Could you briefly explain how diplomatic style, diplomacy and foreign policy differ from each other? The big difference is between diplomacy and foreign policy. So this is quite difficult to explain because in the United States, diplomacy and foreign policy are exactly the same. You'll see the terms used interchangeably. On the British side, though, in Australia and the United Kingdom, diplomacy and foreign policy are two different things. Foreign policy involves the creation of foreign policy, whereas diplomacy involves the implementation of foreign policy. On the one side, you have those who are at the top level creating the foreign policy and initiating the ideas. And at the other side, you have those who are implementing the ideas on the ground at the forefront, you know, the cutting edge of interaction between states. Let's briefly look at an example for diplomatic style. A recent article in The Economist about the possibility of Britain leaving the European Union stated that, and I quote, tough negotiators like the South Koreans are unlikely to offer Britain the same deal they gave the EU. This reputation as tough negotiators on trade issues thus refers to South Korea's diplomatic style? Yeah, certainly it does. Quite often, you know, you'll, you'll find texts on negotiating style and that's a very prominent academic subject. But on diplomatic style, there's, you know, I think this is the first book focusing on diplomatic style. So there's a big difference between negotiating style and diplomatic style. 
Negotiation is just one of the you know, four main tasks of diplomacy. You have negotiation, you have representation, you have consular affairs, and you have reporting. Those four main tasks, that is diplomacy. And it's those four main tasks all together, which is diplomacy. Negotiation is just one of those tasks. Your book argues that an understanding of the diplomatic style of a country can help make sense of its foreign policy decision making. How so? Well, diplomatic style is all about policy relevance. Diplomatic style is best understood by practitioners themselves. If you're not a practitioner, it's really hard to get a full understanding of diplomatic style. It comes from the day-to-day -day interaction, the day-to-day -day working with partner diplomats. And through this day-to-day -day interaction, this is where you get the understanding of what is relevant in the context of your partner. There's a good example I put in the text at the very beginning. You know, I was talking to, for one of my field interviews, talking to a former intelligence official, and he was seeking to recruit a analyst for the Korean Peninsula. And he had basically two groups of applicants. He had one group of academics, and he had one group of former diplomats. The group of academics, when they spoke about, well, on one particular question, actually, it was one particular question. That question was, um, what would a South Korean diplomat do in the event of finding out that North Korea was about to collapse? And the academics had all very standard answers. They looked at the reporting requirements for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They looked at the structure of the National Security Cabinet. They looked at the justification for entry into the Korean Peninsula. All standard state-to-state, -state, very narrow-minded positivist approaches to state interactions. The diplomats gave a totally different answer. The ex-diplomats were saying things like, well, the diplomat would probably contact his girlfriend, contact his wife, contact his children, arrange them to change their currency into US currency, arrange for them to go to study English overseas. You know, these are all answers which are focused on individuals. And this is what happens in state-to-state -state relations. It's not just states bouncing together on a billiard table. It's individuals, it's humans, it's the emotions, it's the pressures, it's even the family pressures, which can affect the way states interact. And I think this shows that diplomatic style really does bring a lot to foreign policy because you understand that intense pressure that a diplomat is under you have a better understanding of how they're going to make decisions. You have a better understanding of how they're going to make key decisions on foreign policy issues. As crude as this question may be, we are far from the era when a diplomat had the signature of the king and could negotiate treaties on his own. Now with improved communications, the president and the higher executives of the country are the ones deciding. So what weight does a diplomat's decision actually carry? This question is best answered by looking at a wider debate in diplomatic studies at the moment. And that's the debate on the relevance of diplomacy. So as you mentioned, traditionally, um, diplomacy played, you could argue, a much more prominent role. You know, having plenipotentiary powers meant that an ambassador in a foreign country was you know, representing the executive and they played the role of the executive in place of the executive in a foreign country. And of course, this has changed massively, particularly today. Foreign ministries used to be the gatekeeper between governments. If you were in one government, perhaps in the education ministry or the environment ministry, and you wanted to speak to the education ministry or environment ministry of another country, you'd have to go through the foreign ministry. You know, it's a big argument in diplomatic studies today whether that gatekeeper role still exists. Perhaps nowadays we know that education ministry will talk to the education ministry, they'll just pick up the phone. When an Australian education ministry wants to speak to the Indonesian education ministry, they pick up the phone and they talk. They don't have to go through the foreign ministry anymore. So this gatekeeper role has greatly decreased. But at the same time, there's still a very important role for the understanding and I guess even the smaller decisions which are made in foreign policy interaction. And I think one of the important things when it comes back to diplomatic style is that the understanding of the foreign country. It's really hard to get that full understanding of a foreign country unless you are actually there undertaking day-to-day -day interactions with that country. And I think that's where the real relevance of diplomatic style comes through. If diplomatic style describes the pattern of behavior that characterizes diplomats from a specific country, does this imply that diplomatic style is rooted in this country's culture? Or is it rather about the culture of a country's diplomatic corps? 
Uh, diplomatic style is definitely linked to the culture of the country, but it's also linked to a whole range of other sources. That can include the country's national role, it can include the bureaucratic culture within the foreign ministry, it can include the diplomatic history of the country. Diplomatic style can come from a range of different sources. One interesting source is the concept of the ideal diplomat. The ideal diplomat is the conceptualization of what a diplomat should be like or what a diplomat should strive for in life. And this is different in different countries. So in the diplomatic studies literature of different countries, the, the memoirs of former diplomats, in the guidebooks of how to become a diplomat of different countries, you have these different concepts of what a diplomat should be like. It also occurs in the fiction of different countries as well. So this ideal diplomat concept means that you've got these people who are training to be diplomats or wanting to be diplomats of a young age and they're looking at these images of what a diplomat should be like and this is forming their conceptualization of how they should be. So this is another source and there's several other sources of what makes a diplomatic style. And I think all of these sources can be spread across and when you bring them together you get that country's diplomatic style. Does this imply that even non-diplomats from a certain country would exhibit these same behaviors? After all, they're all equally shaped by culture. To a certain extent, but no, because you know, not all individuals from a certain country would have gone through the process of becoming a diplomat. So when you're becoming a diplomat, you go through a certain process. For example, in South Korea, for a long time, becoming a diplomat meant going to a certain school. It meant going through a certain examination. And that process changes the person. And once you're inside the foreign ministry, again, that changes you incredibly. In Australia, for example, traditionally, if you were in the diplomatic service, you would wear a certain, basically, uniform. You would wear a certain suit and tie. And everyone else from the rest of the public service would recognize this certain suit and certain tie. And you know, through experiencing your professional life in that culture, that bureaucratic culture, you have certain ways of behaving. So not every individual from a country would have the same ability to reproduce that style. It all comes through the process of becoming a diplomat and the life of a diplomat. So far we've been speaking in somewhat abstract terms. Uh, very quickly, could you give us a few examples of diplomatic styles and what characterizes them? Well, perhaps it's better to answer this question by thinking about what others have thought about other countries' diplomatic styles rather than myself. Writing back in 1939, uh, the famous British diplomat Sir Harold Nicholson wrote about other countries' diplomatic styles in a very frank and straightforward way. So he characterized German diplomatic style as very militaristic and the desire to win. He characterized a French diplomatic style as very flamboyant and always extremely you know, seeking to get uh, the position more than anything else. And the Italian diplomatic style is seeking short-term gains rather than long-term uh, security. And interestingly enough, Sir Harold Nicholson, I guess reflecting his time, also mentioned Oriental diplomatic styles. He bunched them all together and he said, I think I'm uh, paraphrasing here, he said something like, don't worry what is in the Oriental's mind, just be sure what is in your mind. Uh, so quite a negative and quite a racist uh, commentary on Oriental diplomatic styles, but characteristics of the time, I guess. How does this diplomatic style relate to diplomats' individual personalities? Does it shape them? Does it require certain personalities? And what about the personal style of diplomats? Of course, diplomatic style is, is really just, it's a framework for trying to analyze uh, a country's diplomacy. Uh, individual personalities are always going to, I guess, ride over the top of diplomatic style. They're always going to affect diplomatic style. So even if you know there is a distinct American diplomatic style, uh, you'd have an individual who is perhaps even at the top of the state's diplomacy who could have a character which is entirely distinct and it can totally change that country's diplomatic style to a certain extent. So I'm thinking, of course, of uh, Kissinger, whose emotionalism was known to affect the entire State Department's uh, style in interacting with other nations. And there's been a few studies on that emotionalism, and, and this can have a great effect on a country's diplomacy. One thing about change in terms of diplomatic style, should we think in the frame of a few years, or are we talking about decades, centuries? How fast does diplomatic style change? I think that really depends upon the country. 
There is a very long-term aspect to diplomatic style, particularly when you're talking about a country's national role or a country's culture or even bureaucratic culture. These all change very slowly. But then some countries have very rapid changes even within generations. So, of course, I'm talking about South Korean diplomatic style here. You have an aspect of generational change in the South Korean foreign ministry where you have, I guess, bifurcated diplomatic style with an older generation with a very distinct style and a younger generation which is coming on board nowadays with a very different and changing diplomatic style. We will talk about these different styles in a few moments, but first, in your book you outline four ideal types of diplomatic styles. Why did you choose to do this? And could you briefly introduce these ideal types, if possible with some examples? So based upon Weber's ideal type, uh, Weber gives four different types of social action. They include value rational action, purposive rational action, tradition oriented action, and emotion oriented action. So I went through classic diplomatic texts to try to understand how these four different ideal types of social action are expressed in diplomacy. So I looked at Machiavelli's The Prince and other texts by Machiavelli. And Machiavelli is very much a purposive, rational, uh, diplomatic action. He demonstrates that even when there are values which should be upheld, the purpose or the objective is much more important. Uh, throughout classic diplomatic studies texts, there's always an idea that a diplomat should be honest. That's one of the key criteria of being a good diplomat. Yet Machiavelli says, well, it's very important to appear to be honest. And, and this is purposive, rational diplomatic style. Another diplomatic style is the traditional diplomatic style. And for traditional oriented diplomatic style, I looked at the text of Francois de Cayère, who was a French diplomat in the 19th century. And he was somebody who, in his lifetime, was not focused on tradition. In fact, he was very much an innovator and a very much a modernizer of French diplomacy. But he's since become very much a focus on tradition. So when people look for diplomatic tradition, they look towards Francois de Cayère for an understanding of diplomatic tradition. So somebody who focuses on tradition, uh, a diplomat who focuses on tradition is somebody who is going to, for example, ensure that all the protocols are followed through. There's no room for changing protocol or innovating new ideas. It's all about doing exactly what was done before. Another type of diplomatic style is the emotion-oriented diplomatic style. For emotion-oriented diplomatic style, I looked at the works of Ernest Mason Sato, a British diplomat. Sato was a, a very interesting diplomat in that everything he'd done was anti-emotion. His classic text of diplomatic method, he does not use a personal pronoun, not even once. In all of his writings, in his letters, even in his diaries, he hardly uses personal pronouns. He's very anti-emotion. But this is a very good characterization of the opposite. And in diplomacy, it's known amongst diplomats that you should always try to hide your own emotions and you know, utilize the other side's emotions. And so this contrast between anti-emotion and emotion is very interesting in the works of Sato. The last one is the value rational diplomatic style. For value rational diplomatic style, I looked at the works of Harold Nicholson. As I mentioned, uh, quite a famous British diplomat. He's got a very famous text called Diplomacy. And Harold Nicholson was one of the first people to actually focus on diplomatic style. He dedicates an entire chapter of his text, Diplomacy, to diplomatic style, where he characterizes the different diplomatic styles of different countries. Now, value rational diplomacy is all about the idea that values are all important. There's no point achieving something unless you're upholding values first. Now, whether or not Harold Nicholson was really like this, we don't know, but it is a particular type of character and a particular type of diplomacy as well. And you can see this in several countries' diplomacies today. You can see this in the way certain diplomats behave and their insistence upon values rather than achieving the ends. In your book, you illustrate the concept of diplomatic style with the case of South Korea. How does one go about researching a country's diplomatic style? Well, I think it's important, first of all, to recognize why South Korea. And it's quite strange to look at South Korea's diplomatic style because, quite frankly, there's not many books which look at South Korea's foreign policy. There is, there's a, a limited number of texts which look at South Korea's foreign policy. If you look at the number of texts on South Korea's foreign policy, you could count them on you know, one hand. If you look at the texts on North Korea, 
and North Korea's foreign policy, well, you know, you've got bookshelves full of them. Um, if you look at texts and papers on South Korea's negotiating style, a very small number. If you look at the texts and papers on North Korea's negotiating style, well, there's several and they're you know, excellent texts. But this is really strange when you think about South Korea, a country which is the 13th largest in GDP in the globe. South Korea, which is a country which for most other countries is a major trading partner. Yet there's more books and more texts on North Korea. And this is entirely strange for me to think, why would somebody want to study North Korea when in reality it's the decisions made in Seoul which are much more important than the decisions made in Pyongyang for a country like Australia, for Canada, for Thailand, Malaysia, Burma, any other country except perhaps the United States, it's much more important to be studying what goes on in South Korea, South Korea's foreign policy, South Korea's diplomacy, than it is to be looking at North Korea. And in practice, what does such research involve? Well, it's very difficult to investigate diplomatic style. I mean, style itself is a very difficult concept to understand. Diplomatic style in particular is really hard because a lot of it rests in practice. It's tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge is something you can't gain unless you're in the practice and doing it yourself. So it's really difficult to get an understanding of this diplomatic style. One way, methodological way, which I found to get this information was through narrative storytelling. Basically getting diplomats to tell their stories, tell their stories amongst the diplomatic corps in Seoul, to tell their stories about their interaction with South Korean officials, investigating with South Korean officials and getting them to tell their stories about their diplomacy. You, know, you get a really good picture. Once people tell a story again and again and again and they tell the story again, People have this natural and likable tendency to want to impress and to want to convey meaning in their stories. And through this, you can get a much greater in-depth understanding of diplomatic style. You mentioned earlier that the diplomatic style of South Korea has been changing recently. Could you tell us what it used to be and what is it becoming now? At the moment, I believe there's a, almost a generational divide in South Korean diplomatic style. The older generation, in their foreign policy interests, have a very narrow range. They're interested in economic development, and they're interested in demonstrating that South Korea is the legitimate Korean nation. You're focused on North Korea. The younger generation has much more diverse interests. Their foreign policy interests range from development to particular countries to uh, human rights, a much greater variety of interests. And I think this also has a generational divide in the style as well. The older generation of South Korean diplomats are quite uh, not willing to show emotion. Younger generation of diplomats are much more willing to show emotion. They're much more willing to show anger or show frustration or even show disdain or unhappiness at different events. And I think you know, this may be a generational divide in South Korean society as well. And I think anyone who studies South Korean society can see this, but it's quite distinct in diplomatic style as well. Using the ideal types you mentioned earlier, how would you categorize these generational divides? Well, the older generation of uh, South Korean diplomats are definitely very purposive rational. They're focused on achieving a particular ends. And those two ends are, of course, demonstrating South Korea as a legitimate Korean nation and also achieving economic development. The younger generation is becoming much more value rational, but also emotion oriented, starting to change quite a lot, particularly in the younger diplomats. Is there any specific breakpoint when we can divide between the two? Maybe a specific event that would have shaped the new generation? I did not investigate that, but I mean, I think anyone who studies Korea probably knows where these generational divides are. I mean, if you think of democratization, it's the largest change, and this obviously changes the way people are educated at school and the way people want to or do not want to become diplomats. And of course, sunshine policy is another big change in that... Uh, the generation after the Sunshine Policy have a totally different view of North Korea. It's no longer a threat to South Korea's security per se, but also a threat to South Korea's way of life. And this obviously changes the way people see North Korea and see the threat of North Korea. Does South Korea's diplomatic style mirror its international position? For example, as a relatively small country in the region of giants with China and Japan. 
I don't think so. I think that's quite separate. If you look at, uh, let's just say, four middle powers, you can see very different styles amongst those four middle powers. So we have Indonesia, Australia, Canada, South Korea. Those four countries around about the same, I guess, balance of power globally, but um, they have very distinct diplomatic styles. Perhaps Australia and Canada are a little bit similar, but um, Indonesia, South Korea, Australia, very different styles. Could you give us an example of how these characteristics of South Korea's diplomatic style actually play out in foreign policy making? Some of the stories told to me by South Korean diplomats and by the diplomatic corps in Seoul focused on one particular element, and that was the idea of estrangement, the idea of separation. These diplomats believed that one of the reasons that South Korean diplomacy had its particular style was because of the idea that they're separated from the rest of the globe. And this really intrigued me. And looking back at the history of Korea as a nation, you can see this separation and this attempt to mediate separation. So if you think of Korea during the Japanese occupation, during that time, Korea didn't have a diplomatic corps. It didn't have a foreign ministry. Yet there was still diplomacy occurring and there was a need to be able to enter the diplomatic system. There was a lot of diplomacy going on during that period, informal diplomacy between South Korean individuals trying to promote South Korea at the uh, Hague Convention, trying to meet senior officials in the United States. A lot of informal diplomacy trying to mediate this estrangement or this separation from the rest of the globe. And you can see this in 1950s and 1960s South Korea as well. The idea that they need to mediate this estrangement from the rest of the globe, the idea that you need to get into international society and you need to be part of international society from the campaign to join the United Nations back in the 1950s all the way up till when they actually joined the United Nations in the 1990s, this idea that you need to mediate estrangement. And this idea of mediation of estrangement affects South Korean diplomatic style in many ways. So some diplomats would even tell me that South Korean diplomats have this particular desire to be part of different gatherings or a particular desire to be accepted as part of different groupings. This need to actually mediate estrangement. And I found that very interesting. In many ways, South Korea seems interested in checking boxes as much as possible, being part of such organization or such other uh, treaty. Would you link all of that to this feeling of estrangement? Yeah, you know, I think that's actually a really good example you've come up with. Yeah, the idea of checking boxes, the idea of being part of the organization, being part of the grouping, it's very much become a characteristic. And other academics and other commentators have seen this. And yeah, I would put it down to the desire to mediate estrangement and the desire to really be part and almost be central in global affairs. In a recent article in the Korea Herald, you illustrate the South Korean diplomatic style with the country's most famous diplomat, Ban Ki-moon, currently the General Secretary of the United Nations. In a recent article from The Economist, he was described as, and I quote, painfully ineloquent, addicted to protocol and lacking in spontaneity and depth. Is that emblematic of the Korean diplomatic style? I think you have to look at this from a much broader perspective. Whether or not you like Bun's diplomatic style is irrelevant. I think what's much more important is the ability of South Korea to position Ban Ki-moon in the United Nations Secretary General position. And this is incredible. This really shows that South Korea's foreign policy and its diplomatic style has actually been very successful. You know, I think uh, the recent article pointed out that he was favored as the preferred candidate because of his, well, lack of power, his lack of ability to do something. But, you know, I think from looking at it from a South Korean foreign policy perspective, well, it was doing something and getting him there. And I think that's the way you should look at it. It's brought South Korean diplomatic style to a global audience and it's brought South Korean foreign policy to a global audience. It's brought issues of relevance of South Korea to a global audience. But if he's been described in such a way, doesn't that mean that South Korea's diplomatic style thus might sometimes clash with the expectations of others? I think diplomatic styles of every country always clash, but that's the role of diplomats to overcome these clashes in diplomatic style. 
diplomats are there in order to have an understanding of the other country's diplomatic style. And that's the inherent quality of a diplomat, being able to understand style and to cope with that style and to work with that style to achieve better outcomes. If one were to make a pros and cons list of South Korea's diplomatic style, what would it be? I think one of the best aspects of South Korea's diplomatic style at the moment is having diplomats who are very well resourced. Uh, South Korea's put a lot of money and put a lot of effort into improving its diplomats over the last 10 years. And I think this means that South Korea's diplomats are, have a greater confidence and are better resourced than, let's say, other middle powers. South Korea's diplomats are also very determined. They're very determined to achieve their particular aims, and they're also very focused in achieving those aims. Weaknesses? Well, perhaps they're a little bit too determined in certain circumstances. But another great weakness is something which South Korea's diplomats can't really do anything about, and that is the structures of foreign policy which hold them back to a certain degree. A lot of the ideas and a lot of the policy initiatives are very innovative and very creative. But when you're in a structure where you have only five years of a presidential administration to achieve your foreign policy aims, it's a very short time frame. So most foreign policy initiatives, particularly global initiatives, take a good degree of time to, to build and to maintain and to strengthen. And having five years, it's very difficult to do. When you're in a Westminster parliamentary system, perhaps you've got one administration, then another administration, and perhaps even another. You've got eight years or maybe even 10 years to undertake foreign policy initiatives. Under South Korea's presidential system, you only have five years. But on top of that, there's a great deal of differentiation between administrations. So even if you're going from an administration of one party to the same party, because of the weakened party system and focus on individuals, you have a great deal of differentiation between presidential administrations. On top of that, again, you have North Korea. The regularity of North Korea's actions and disturbances means that any foreign policy administration, you know, with five years, that time period is cut down to around about three years. You have three years from the beginning of an administration until North Korea does something enough to break up your foreign policy initiatives and refocus your entire foreign policy once again on North Korea. So South Korea's diplomats, they may have great style and they may have great qualities, but they're burdened by structures which hold them back. You just mentioned that South Korean diplomats can be very determined. As part of your research, you spoke to foreign diplomats who have experienced dealing with South Korean diplomats. How is their diplomatic style generally perceived? Is South Korea's diplomatic style pleasant or is it sometimes difficult to deal with? To a degree, this depended upon which diplomat I was talking to. Some of the strengths of South Korean diplomatic style was being well-resourced. So in those contexts, the diplomats I talked to would be very happy to work with South Korean diplomats because they know that they're going to get somebody who is hardworking and very determined to actually achieve those aims. But when the policy aims are differing, of course, you know, that totally changes. The diplomats would be more concerned about that well-resourced and that determined and focused behavior of the South Korean diplomats. In 2013, the institute in charge of the formation of South Korean diplomats now called the Korea National Diplomatic Academy, reformed itself and moved away from the traditional big road learning exams. Why this change and what does that tell us about the direction of South Korea's diplomatic style? This is definitely one of the very important changes in South Korea's training for diplomats, I guess in the history of South Korea's foreign ministry. It's a very forward-looking and a very long-term outlook for South Korea's diplomacy. I think the KNDA demonstrates that South Korea is very keen on improving its diplomats and improving its capability to send individuals, not just diplomats, but also other individuals to international organizations and to play a greater role in global society. In your opinion, is this due to a dissatisfaction with prior training or is it more forward-looking? Well, inevitably, it's a combination of both. I mean, when the KNDA was established, there were those media reports regarding dissatisfaction with the current diplomatic training system. But it's definitely a forward-looking idea. It's definitely a long-term venture to improve South Korea's diplomacy.
Something striking and probably unique about South Korean diplomacy is the attempt to bring up North Korea in as many forms as possible. One interesting example is how South Korea is trying to have MICTA, a group of middle powers and regional powers which include Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey and Australia, to issue statements about human rights or nuclear proliferation in North Korea. Is this a trait you consider part of the South Korean diplomatic style? It's definitely a trait of South Korea's diplomatic style, but it's a trait which is decreasing with time. You know, if you think about South Korea's diplomacy going back to the 1960s, 70s and 80s, this was a sole focus. Development and North Korea were the sole focus of South Korea's foreign policy at the time. And for its individual diplomats, it was also a sole focus. It would be brought up in every meeting. Nowadays, that's changing and it's changing very rapidly. MICTA is not only focused on North Korea, by far, it's focused on many other things. And it is largely a, a Korean innovation and creation to bring together those middle power countries. And, you know, MICTA is still searching for an aim. It's still searching for a, a clear objective that can bring those countries together. Whether or not it brings North Korea into that, I think it's just one of the areas that those five countries can have a little bit of influence. In the case of South Korea, if diplomatic style is known mostly by practitioners, how can research be conducted on the topic and what does it add to the understanding of South Korean foreign policy? It's certainly very true that diplomatic style is very much the domain of practitioners. So much so that for many countries, for many smaller countries, when diplomats come back from South Korea, they quite often go into another path in government, and that path in government can end up becoming an analyst of South Korea. So that means that an understanding of diplomatic style goes straight into an analytical or intelligence role focusing on South Korea. But that's where the problem lies, because a lot of that knowledge which they've built up during their posting in South Korea maintains or is sustained within government rather than being spread to an academic community. So what needs to be done is a greater freedom for returning diplomats to undertake seminars with academic organizations, to undertake internships or fellowships with academic organizations, to spread that understanding of diplomatic style to a much wider audience. But unfortunately, this is happening at exactly the same time when most countries are trying to cut back on what diplomats are allowed to say, cut back on even what ex-diplomats are allowed to say. One of the most um, interesting and intriguing areas that has been cut back is the valedictory speech. So a lot of diplomats, uh, when they were retired in the United Kingdom, used to be able to give a valedictory speech. Sometimes it was quite difficult for governments to handle a valedictory speech because it would be inevitably complaining about the job which they had just finished. But you know, this allowed a lot of the understanding of diplomatic style to be spread to a very broad audience. But these have all gone now, and a lot of countries are cutting out valedictory speeches or ensuring that diplomats are not able to spread the ideas and the, the knowledge they've gained to a wider audience. And I think this is unfortunate. To conclude, what does an improved knowledge of South Korea's diplomatic style mean for diplomats of other countries? If you had to deal with South Korean diplomats, how would you use the knowledge of their diplomatic style into your approach? I think the greatest benefit is the policy relevance that can be brought to other areas. So if you have an understanding of diplomatic style, everything you've studied in academia or everything you've studied or read about a country is refined and only the areas which are highly policy relevant become the object of your focus. Professor Jeffrey Robertson, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.